Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And in our ongoing series on Nobel Prize winners, tonight we're going to discuss Dr. Oliver Smithies, who died recently at the age of 91, and he was a co-winner of the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology in 2007 along with Mario Capecchi and Martin Evans for their work in gene targeting. Dr. Smithies came from Halifax in central England. We'll touch on that in a little bit. He went to Oxford and got his graduate degrees there, but he did his Nobel Prize winning work at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. He was the first Nobel Prize winner from the University of North Carolina. They've since had another one. Here is the Nobel Prize Committee announcing the 2007 award in medicine or physiology. The 2007 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine goes to Mario Capecchi, Martin Evans, and Oliver Smithis for their discoveries of principles for introducing specific gene modifications in mice by the use of embryonic stem cells. <clears throat> Oliver Smithis, who is Excellence Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, United States. He is a very multi-talented scientist and he is also a keen aviator, flying his own airplane. Well, gene targeting is essentially a strategy where you can identify a gene, change it, replace it into a different organism, in this case mammals, mice, in the work of Dr. Smithies, and then you can study the new genetic code and the effects it has on the targeted animal. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. First, here is Dr. Smithies talking about his background. He comes from an area of England that has probably as high a per capita rate of Nobel Prize winners as anywhere in the world. He mentions three, but there are actually four in his county. And then he talks about the circuitous route at which he came to what is now known as molecular biology. I, I was born in a small village in the north of England, a population of 1,500. I, I'll mention something else about that, because five miles upstream on the same river, there's another town uh, called Todmorden. And that has 15,000 population, 1,500 in my village, Copley, 15,000 in Todmorden. They have two Nobel laureates. So three Nobel laureates within five miles, all on the same river. I think it's the water. I went to a village school and, um, and then to the local grammar school. Grammar schools in England date back to many of them to Elizabethan days. Day. So the school was founded in something like 1525 is my remembrance of the date. And uh, they've been, uh, it's been a free school for children. It was uh, just for boys uh, until recently, ever since. Uh, although it no longer exists, it's been fused into something else. Uh, but uh, I got, from there I got a scholarship to Oxford and specifically to Balliol College. And that's uh, where I did, uh, first of all, started off as a medical student and, and decided uh, partway through that course of work that I'd rather be what we now call the molecular biologist. But in those days, uh, that term hadn't been invented. But I wanted to work with uh, a professor there whose name was Sa Sandy Ogston, a leading person in founding that field. Uh, I did an extra degree then of chemistry because I uh, felt I needed both biology and chemistry. And then I did a PhD with him, DPhil, as it is in Oxford University, uh, learning how to, well, devising an apparatus to measure very precisely uh, osmotic pressures of protein solutions. That's a, a way of determining protein concentration and understanding how they behave when they're in solution. I mean, it was a very precise method, um, but I, I'm i rather amused to be able to say that nobody ever cared about it because the paper I published was never quoted by anybody. And I sometimes tell students, well, you see, it teaches you something about what you should do for your PhD. You should do something that will teach you good science. It doesn't terribly matter what it is, as long as you learn to do good science. And since it doesn't matter, it's pretty important that you enjoy it. Sandy Oxton, by the way, was one of the great teachers at Oxford. He was renowned for his simple solutions to complex problems. All of this led Dr. Smithies to the field of gene identification and gene targeting. And here, one of the representatives of the Nobel Committee explains the work 
of Dr. Smithies and his co-Nobel Prize winners. Introduction of specific gene modifications in mice by the use of embryonic stem cells is more popularly referred to as gene targeting, which is the term that I will use uh, as I go. Gene targeting has meant a revolution to biomedical sciences because it allows us to establish the function of genes in normal physiology, in healthy conditions, but also in pathophysiology, in disease. Mice are mice and men are men. Although we may consider ourselves as the multitasking crown of evolution, it's actually so that we share approximately 95% of our genes with the mice. And this means that by studying mouse genetics, we can infer the function of our own genes. So today, gene targeting uh, is taken for granted by many of us who work in the biomedical field. But let's go back some 25 years in time to the beginning of the 1980s, when the Nobel laureates made their key discoveries. In 1980, targeting a single gene at will, a single gene among the 22,000 genes that each cell carries, spread in 3 billion DNA base pairs. It just seems like the classical needle in a haystack problem. And if that wasn't enough, to do that in each of the 100 billion cells of a mouse just seemed impossible. To most of us, but not to Kapecki, Evans, and Smithies, who saw opportunities and did their experiments and discoveries in a very systematic way. By targeting genes in cells, we may learn wonderful things about gene function in cells. But cells don't have blood pressure, and cells don't develop Alzheimer's disease, and cells don't get rheumatoid arthritis. So if we want to understand the function of genes for those processes, we will have to target the genes in whole animals. So these are the key discoveries. Kapecki and Smithis independently of each other, discovered that gene targeting occurred in mammalian cells, or could be done in mammalian cells. Evans discovered the embryonic stem cells, which opened the window to the whole mouse. So let's begin by looking at what gene targeting really is. So in order to target the gene, and here is the target gene, hidden in the cell uh, among the three billion base pairs, so that's the one we want to reach. So in order to do that, we need to know something about the target gene. In other words, we have to clone it. Gene cloning essentially means bringing a gene into a test tube in purified form. Once in the test tube, the gene can be changed. This is done by molecular biology technology, which is uh, also taken for granted, and which is based on knowledge of DNA structure, gene sequencing, and PCR which are all major discoveries that have been awarded the Nobel Prize in the past. By introducing this change into the clone gene, we may change the function at will. So we may turn the gene off, which is referred to as a gene knockout, or we may turn the gene on, often referred to as a gene knock on. Or uh, we may change the gene basically in any way that we want, often in subtle ways to modify its function just slightly, and that is referred to as knock-in. So once we have made these changes to the clone gene, it's called the targeting vector. Next, the targeting vector is introduced into cells. And here comes the magic. By help of a cellular enzymatic machinery, the targeting vector manages to find the target gene and recombine with it, homologous recombination. And in the next step, the two DNA molecules exchange pieces of DNA between them, such that the piece of DNA which was introduced, or the change that was introduced in the targeting vector, now ends up in the target gene. The target gene is now called the targeted gene. That, in brief, were the discoveries made by Kapecki and Smithis, gene targeting in mammalian cells. Well, as with many of the recent discoveries in medicine and physiology that led to Nobel Prizes, this had immense practical significance. It basically rapidly expanded the field of molecular genetics 
and open up whole new areas of study of common diseases and not so common diseases. And here the Nobel Committee man describes that. Gene targeting in mammalian cells, embryonic stem cells as vehicles to the whole mouse. And these discoveries were made between 1981 and 1986. And in 1989, the first reports were published where all the techniques which, came, uh, which became available through these discoveries were brought together into one experiment generating the first gene-targeted mice. Since 1989, there has been uh, an explosion of the utility and importance of gene-targeting technology. More than 10,000 different gene-targeted mice have been produced. So that means that approximately half of the mammalian genes have already been targeted, and we are now well on the way to create gene-targeted mice for all mammalian genes or for all mouse genes. This has led to uh, many new uh, and highly important models for human diseases. More than 500 have been reported so far, and I mentioned just a few examples. Cardiovascular disease is a very good example, and there are many models for cardiovascular diseases generated by gene targeting in mice. And through these models, we have, among other things, learned of the importance of inflammation uh, in this disease process and the interplay between genetics and environmental factors such as the diet for the development of the disease. Diabetes is another well-known disease and through the help of many models of gene targeted mice for diabetes we have learned that this disease is far more complex than previously anticipated and that many more subforms of the disease exist. Cystic fibrosis is one of the many, many examples of monogenic inherited disorders that have been uh, obtained by the help of gene targeting and which were not existing before. And finally, I would just like to mention that by gene targeting, it's now also possible to change single genes in mice so that they, they encode the human version of a particular protein rather than the mouse version, which becomes very important in drug development because it allows uh, pharmaceutical industry, for instance, to test the efficiency of their drugs directly on human proteins in an animal model. So in summary, gene targeting has really meant a, a paradigm shift for biomedicine because gene functions can now be determined systematically. We can study the genes one by one mapping their functions. Secondly, the causal role of gene mutations for disease can be established. And before gene targeting, mutations and disease could be correlated only. But by the help of gene targeting, a direct causality can be established in experiments. Tailored models of human diseases have been obtained. And I think it's fair to say that gene targeting is now used in all areas of basic and applied biomedicine. Well, if possible, I usually like to close with some advice that our Nobel Prize winner gives to young people, and Dr. Smithies did not disappoint. I've never done a day's work in my life, because what I do is what I want to do and what I enjoy doing. So that's uh, the message that really I want to convey to all of you students is don't do something that is work for the rest of your lives. Find something that you enjoy so much that you can say, as I said, I never did a day's work. <laughs> Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. In tribute to Dr. Smithies and his work on genes, we're going to close with a different kind of gene, a swinging blue gene. And in fact, the swinging blue genes were from Liverpool, about 60 miles from where Dr. Smithies grew up, just over an hour on M62. This is their best-known song from 1964, written and first done by American rocker Chan Romero. Covered by the Beatles next, by the way. And then the swing and blue jeans made it into an international smash. The hippie hippie shake. Oh, good day. I got the hippie hippie shake.